Globalization and the International Working Class, a Marxist Assessment, Introduction. At the end of the 20th century, world capitalism is undergoing structural changes as fundamental and far-reaching as those associated with the Industrial Revolution at the end of the 18th century and the rise of monopoly capital in the final years of the 19th. The advent of transnational corporations, which operate on a world scale and produce directly for the world market, is the central feature of a new and higher international division of labor based on an unprecedented global integration of production. The world economy today is characterized by the daily movement of vast quantities of capital across national borders, as international financial institutions scour stock and bond markets for the highest return on their investments. These sums dwarf the capital at the disposal of any national government or central bank. Transnational corporations coordinate production, design, marketing, and management facilities on many continents and exploit a labor market that is increasingly global in character. Just as the invention of the steam engine fueled the Industrial Revolution, revolutionary advances in technology associated with the microchip and the integrated circuit have facilitated the globalization of production and led to an explosive development of computers and telecommunications. Combined with a dramatic lowering of transportation costs, the new technology has enabled corporations to organize the production of commodities across national and even continental divides. Unlike the multinational corporation, whose foreign outposts produced almost entirely for the national markets in which they were located, the far-flung facilities of the modern transnational corporation produce for the world market. Far from opening up new historical vistas for the profit system, these economic and technological developments have raised, to an unprecedented level, the basic contradictions that have afflicted world capitalism throughout the 20th century. They have greatly intensified the conflicts between world economy and the capitalist nation-state system, and between social production and private ownership. During the post-war economic boom, a series of regulatory mechanisms allowed the containment of these conflicts, but the vast changes in production processes, communications, and international finance over the past 40 years have rendered the nation-state increasingly obsolete so far as the organization of production is concerned. This signifies the emergence of a new period of mass revolutionary struggles by the working class. As Marx explained, almost 150 years ago, the origin of revolutions lie not, in the first instance, in changes in consciousness, but rather in objective social processes. It is these that constitute the driving forces behind those shifts in the political orientation and consciousness of broad masses that characterize a revolutionary period. To quote Marx, at a certain stage of development, the material productive forces of society come into conflict with the existing relations of production, or this merely expresses the same thing in legal terms with the property relations within the framework of which they have operated hitherto. From forms of development of the productive forces, these relations turn into their fetters, then begins an era of social revolution. To the short-sighted observer, who cannot see beyond the disorientation afflicting the workers' movement in the wake of the collapse of the Soviet Union and the breakdown of the old parties and trade union organizations, the perspective of socialist revolution appears totally unrealistic, or, at best, consigned to the indefinite future. But, as Marx further elaborated, just as one does not judge an individual by what he thinks about himself, so one cannot judge such a period of transformation by its consciousness, but, on the contrary, this consciousness must be explained from the contradictions of material life, from the conflict existing between the social forces of production and the relations of production. The disintegration of the Stalinist regimes and the collapse of the traditional workers' organizations have given rise to confusion in the workers' movement, but closer examination reveals that its origins lie in the deep-going crisis of the nation-state itself, resulting from the globalization of production, in other words, the collapse of the old organizations and the perplexity this has produced in the workers' movement are, in the final analysis, the outcome of of historical processes that are preparing the way for revolutionary struggles.
It is not the perspective of socialism that has collapsed, but the nationalist programs to which the working class was confined for a whole historical period. The breakdown of the Stalinist regimes has demonstrated the unviability of the program of national autarky pursued by the bureaucracy under the banner of socialism in one country, while the reformist programs of the trade unions and labor parties, based on an expanding and protected national economy, have been shattered by the sweeping changes in the organization of capitalist production. The International Committee of the Fourth International has, during the past decades, developed an analysis of the globalization of capitalist production and its implications for the working class and the revolutionary socialist movement. The world capitalist crisis and the tasks of the Fourth International, the perspectives resolution adopted by the International Committee of the Fourth International in August 1988, stated, It has long been an elementary position of Marxism that the class struggle is national only as to form, but that it is, in essence, an international struggle. However, Given the new features of capitalist development, even the form of the class struggle must assume an international character. Even the most elementary struggles of the working class pose the necessity for coordinating its actions on an international scale. It is a basic fact of economic life that transnational corporations exploit the labor power of workers in several countries to produce a finished commodity, and that they distribute and shift production between their plants in different countries and on different continents in search of the highest rate of profit. Thus, the unprecedented mobility of capital has rendered all nationalist programs for the labor movement of different countries obsolete and reactionary. Such national programs are invariably based on the voluntary collaboration of the labor bureaucracies with their ruling classes and the systematic lowering of workers' living standards to strengthen the position of their capitalist country in the world market. This analysis, pioneered by the ICFI, has been verified in the bitter experiences of the working class as well as by innumerable empirical studies of the workings of global capitalism. Even as these words were being written, the financial collapse of the East Asian tiger nations was sending shockwaves through every part of the world economy, triggering banking and industrial failures in Japan and calling into question the stability of stock markets in Europe and the U.S. Western bankers and political figures were issuing dire warnings that the anarchic workings of the market in today's globalized economy threatened to plunge the world into a deflationary spiral similar to the Great Depression of the 1930s. However, within what is generally defined as the left or radical movement, specifically those organizations which originated as part of the radicalization of middle-class layers in the 1960s, the overwhelming consensus is that nothing fundamental has changed in the nature of capitalism, and globalization is merely a myth invented by the bourgeoisie. And here it is necessary to insert a note on political terminology. While making use of the terms such as left and radical in reference to these organizations, we do so with the understanding that there is nothing genuinely radical, let alone Marxist, in their politics. Their evolution has brought them to very right-wing political positions. Their embrace of the labor and trade union bureaucracies and their orientation to the capitalist state itself is an expression of the movement to the right over an entire period of a definite social element, perhaps more accurately described as the milieu of petty bourgeois ex-radicals. The evaluation of the significance of the globalization of production and its implications for the struggles of the working class have become the dividing line between Marxism and all forms of middle-class radicalism. Whatever the particular differences among them, the defining feature of all the radical tendencies has been their inherent nationalism. This has received its most concrete expression in their deep-seated hostility to the development of an international strategy based on the independent role of the working class. Denouncing such a perspective as unrealistic and sectarian, the left petty bourgeois tendencies adapted themselves to the Stalinist and social democratic bureaucracies that dominated the labor movement in the advanced capitalist countries, while hailing the petty bourgeois nationalist movements in the oppressed countries as leaders of the struggle for socialism. 
These groups had their heyday in the post-war boom when a nationalist perspective appeared to bring certain immediate gains. It seemed far more realistic than the fight for a program based on the long-term historical interests of the working class, but once again the contradictions of capitalism have proven far more powerful than the perspectives of the opportunists. With the disintegration of the traditional parties and left labor and trade union leaderships, under the impact of globalization, these radical tendencies have been waging a desperate campaign in support of the viability of the national state and their program of applying pressure to it. They claim that globalization was conjured up to deceive workers and discourage them from pursuing a policy of trade unionist pressure on the national state, which, they insist, is the only possible strategy for the working class. A central and universal feature of the rejection of internationalism is a fetishistic attitude towards the trade unions. They demand that the working class accept the authority of the unions and denounce any struggle to break the grip of the trade union bureaucracy. The central proposition advanced by the petty bourgeois ex-radicals are as follows. 1. Globalization does not represent a qualitative change in the structure of world capitalism. The economic and political power of the nation-state remains intact and globalization is essentially a myth, a propaganda campaign initiated by the bourgeoisie to convince the working class that resistance to attacks on wages and conditions is futile. Two. Consequently, the program of trade unionism aimed at securing reforms through the application of pressure to the national state remains viable. 3. The betrayals of the unions are not the outcome of objective processes rooted in world economy and the nature of the unions themselves, but are simply the product of subjective decisions taken by the trade union leaderships. 4. The petty bourgeois nationalist forces in the former colonial countries are the real revolutionary forces, and the perspective of mobilizing the working class on a program of socialist internationalism is an abstract and unrealizable utopia. Underpinning all of these political positions is the repudiation of the Marxist method of historical materialism, which continually seeks to uncover the objective processes which lie at the base of political changes. Rather, the petty bourgeois ex-radicals proceed with a subjectivist method in which politics is reduced to the outcome of the motives and decisions of the individual leaders. We shall examine articles from the petty bourgeois ex-radicals, particularly the Spartacist League, who by virtue of its origins and development is the quintessential representative of American middle-class radicalism. This examination will make clear the class chasm between the program of Marxism and the outlook of petty bourgeois radicalism, and in that way contribute to the education of a new generation of revolutionists. Globalization and the Dynamics of Capitalist Developments The Spartacus' central assertion is that globalization is nothing more than a propaganda campaign aimed at intimidating the working class. Accordingly, they maintain that, insofar as changes have taken place within the world economy, these do not represent a qualitative transformation. The internationalization of finance capital is hardly new, and in many respects, the world economy was more globalized in the period prior to World War I than it is today, they assert. Quote, for the past few decades, the world capitalist economy has been returning to the norms of pre-1914 imperialist order. To maintain a sense of perspective, one should understand that only in the early 1970s did the ratio of world trade to global production once again reach the level attained in 1914, on the eve of the First Imperialist War." End quote. The Spartacus argue that the pre-1914 gold standard and the rapid growth of international trade brought about such an integration of the world economy that the idea that the internationalization of finance capital is a dominant feature of the contemporary profit system is hardly new. The operation of the gold standard, they insist, ensured a degree of financial integration among the advanced capitalist countries that has never been matched since.
At one level, these arguments are simply ridiculous. It is hardly possible to assert that an economy in which international telephone calls were only just beginning to be made and then with great difficulty is, in any meaningful sense, more globally integrated than one where telecommunication systems are used to operate production processes across national borders and instantaneously transfer billions of dollars of capital from one end of the world to the other. Moreover, to claim that the pre-1914 economy was more internationalized than today, based on the fact that international trade or investment flows formed a higher proportion of gross domestic product, is to ignore the fact that large portions of the globe were only just beginning to be integrated into the capitalist economy at the turn of the century. There is a small sense in which the present phase of capitalist globalization represents a return to the past. However, as a review of the economic history of the 20th century will show, this does not confirm the Spartacus League's arguments concerning the viability of the nation-state and the trade union form of organization. On the contrary, it demolishes them. Nothing much can be learned from this method of ripping statistics out of their historical context and mechanically comparing one period to another. It is necessary to examine the dynamics of capitalist development. Such an examination does not show that world capitalism was more globally integrated in the pre-World War I period. Rather, it reveals that, in a fundamental sense, world capitalism is returning at a higher level to the path of development which it began in that period. A recent report by the International Monetary Fund underscores the dynamic growth of the world economy prior to World War I. The period from the mid-19th century to World War I exhibited relatively rapid growth in world trade as the expansion of exports, 3.5% a year, significantly outpaced that of real output, 2.7% a year. The share of exports in world output reached a peak in 1913, not surpassed until 1970. Growth in trade occurred partly as a consequence of reduced tariffs and greatly reduced transportation costs, reflecting the proliferation of railroads and steamships. The period also witnessed a marked convergence of commodity prices across countries. In the 50 years before World War I, there was a massive flow of capital from the core countries of Western Europe to the rapidly developing economies of the Americas, Australia, and elsewhere. At its peak, the net capital outflow from Britain represented 9% of the gross national product, and was almost as high from France, Germany, and the Netherlands. This compares with the peaks in Japan's and Germany's current account surpluses in the mid and late 1980s of 4-5% GDP. Before World War I, private capital moved without restrictions. Much of it flowed into bonds, financing railroads and other infrastructure in the New World, and into long-term government debt, although there was also substantial foreign direct investment. But this process of internationalization did not lead to a harmonious development of the productive forces. On the contrary, it brought about the breakdown of world capitalism and the eruption of World War I, and this had far-reaching political consequences. With the outbreak of the war, the real content of the national reformist perspective of the parties of the Second International and the Trade Unions, which had dominated the movement of the working class prior to the war, was laid bare, and these organizations lined up to support their own ruling classes. Furthermore, the eruption of the historic crisis of capitalism produced by the internationalization of economic processes and taking the form of war between the imperialist powers gave rise to explosive social convulsions. These changed the balance of forces between nationalist opportunism and socialist internationalism in the workers' movement. The internationalist tendency, led by Lenin and Trotsky, a seemingly isolated minority at the start of the war came to the head of an insurgent working class in Russia and led the first successful socialist revolution. It founded a new international, the Third International, which, in the space of a few years, commanded the political allegiance of the most class-conscious and revolutionary-minded workers all over the world.
The 1920s and the 1930s were marked on the one hand by the inability of the bourgeoisie to restore the pre-war equilibrium of the world capitalist system and reconstruct the economic order, and, on the other, by the inability of the working class due to the betrayals of its leadership, first social democracy and then Stalinism, to overthrow the international bourgeoisie. The attempts to reconstruct the pre-war regime through the gold standard collapsed. Britain no longer had the capacity to support the world financial system as it had in the past, and the U.S. was not yet able to do so. International trade collapsed, contracting by two-thirds in the years between 1929 and 1932, while international capital flows all but stopped. The world was plunged into economic depression and then another war. The process of economic reconstruction which began after World War II was not aimed at restoring the pre-war integrated structure of the world capitalist economy. In many ways, it was an attempt to use the national state to hold back the operation of the very international tendencies which had led to the breakdown of world capitalism some three decades earlier. Under the direction of the United States, the pre-war trade blocks were progressively dismantled, and the European market, formerly divided by cartels and tariffs, was integrated. International trade, which had come to a virtual standstill in the 1930s, began to expand once again. The Bretton Woods system, to which we will return in greater detail, led to the expansion of trade and ensured that the currencies could be exchanged at fixed rates, removing the threat of destructive currency devaluation wars. However, the international mobility of capital that had characterized the pre-1914 period was not restored. In fact, in the opinion of the architects of the new system, in particular Harry Dexter White and John Maynard Keynes, it was the international movement of capital which led directly to the collapse of the 1930s. They maintained that the program of social welfare measures and stimulation of demand by government spending, which were necessary to prevent the return of mass unemployment, would be undermined if capital were free to move from one country to another. As Keynes had insisted when first expounding his theories in the 1930s, while goods and ideas could move internationally, it was essential that capital remain, quote, homespun, unquote. At the heart of the post-war reconstruction of world capitalism was the revival of the national economy as the focus for the accumulation of capital, and this led, in turn, to the incorporation of the social democratic parties and unions into the running of the state. They became the administers of the Keynesian programs of social reform and national economic regulation. While the Bretton Woods system was an attempt to block the economic forces that had led to the breakdown of capitalism in 1914, it could not overcome the contradictions of the world capitalist economy. In 1971, the foundations of the Bretton Woods system were shattered with the removal of the gold backing from the U.S. dollar, and in 1973, floating exchange rates were adopted. Once the wall of national regulation was breached, with the demise of fixed currency exchange rates, other changes quickly followed. All of the major capitalist countries dropped their controls on capital movements. The United States and Germany in 1974 and 75, Britain by 1979, Japan by 1980, and the rest of Europe by the 1980s. The so-called developing countries followed suit by progressively ending capital controls and scrapping their national regulatory mechanisms. Since the breakdown of the Bretton Woods system in 1971 and 73, international capital flows which Keynes and others saw as so dangerous for the stability of the capitalist order have increased at a rapid rate. Cross-border transactions in bonds and equities, which were less than 10% of GDP for most advanced capitalist countries in 1980, were more than 100% by 1995. 
gross flows of portfolio investment and foreign investment in the advanced countries more than tripled in the last half of the 1980s and the first half of the 1990s, while the flow of direct foreign investment from the major industrial countries quadrupled between 1984 and 1990. This brief review of the economic history of last century demonstrates the significance of the global transformation now taking place, after several decades in which its internationalizing tendencies were blocked by a series of economic and political factors, world capital over the past several decades has resumed, at an even more rapid pace, the path of development it had begun prior to 1914. The consequences will prove to be even more explosive. Global Economy versus the Nation-State System the vast changes in capitalist production over the past two decades associated with the development of computer technology have fundamentally transformed the world capitalist economy. The emergence of the transnational corporation and the organization of production on a global scale have once again brought to a head the central contradiction of capitalism in the 20th century, that between the world economy expressing the inherent growth and spread of the productive forces and the nation-state system, the basic of bourgeois rule and private property. This is most strikingly expressed in the collapse of all those organizations based on a nationalist perspective. The downfall of the Stalinist regimes in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe was, in the final analysis, an expression of the bankruptcy of the nationalist program of socialism in one country. Likewise, the organic incapacity of the trade unions in the advanced capitalist countries to defend the social position of the working class and their outright collaboration in the imposition of the dictates of capital signify the collapse of the program of social reform based on an expanding national economy. This historical crisis of the capitalist mode of production is the root of the crisis of perspective in the workers' movement, but this very crisis confirms another important prediction of Marx. No problem ever arises without the material conditions for its resolution emerging or being in the process of formation. The globalization of production has brought about a vast expansion in the international working class. The penetration of capitalist production into new regions of the world where, until recently, there was only peasant-based agriculture has transformed millions of people into wage workers. In the advanced capitalist countries, ruthless downsizing carried out by major corporations in the struggle to slash costs and boost profits has ended the relatively privileged status of what were once considered sections of the middle class. It is only in the past few decades that the proletariat has become the numerically predominant social class class on an international scale. The same processes which have brought about the proletarianization of an ever greater proportion of the world's people have produced common conditions of exploitation. Thus, the globalization of production has laid the foundations, as never before, for the international unification of the working class in a common struggle against the transnational corporations and international capital. At the same time, globalized production, undermining the national basis for the organization of economic life, has laid the objective foundations for the development of a planned world socialist economy. The program of Marxism has always been based on the understanding that the nation-state, like the bourgeois property forms it upholds, is a product of historical processes destined to pass into history along with other outmoded forms of social organization such as slavery and feudalism. But if the assertions of the Spartacists are true, then the nation-state has a permanence unforeseen by the founders of scientific socialism. Consequently, the abolition of the nation-state system and the entire framework of bourgeois property is a utopian perspective, for no matter how extensive the development of the productive forces, the nation-state remains the preeminent economic entity. Marx himself put the issue very clearly. If we did not find concealed in society as it is the material conditions of production and the corresponding relations of exchange prerequisite for a classless society, then all attempts to explode it would be quixotic. 
If the growth of the productive forces is not undermining the nation-state system, then we must conclude that the entire Marxist perspective is nothing more than a moral or ethical ideal. Indeed, the perspective of a planned socialist economy in which production is organized by the associated producers is not only an idealist utopia, but a downright harmful program, given the timeless economic viability of the nation-state. Moreover, the perspective for the international unification of the working class, the rallying call of the socialist movement since the publication of the Communist Manifesto 150 years ago, is rendered no less utopian. If the national state retains its viability as the basic economic unit of capitalist production, then the bourgeoisie and its agencies in the workers' movement will always have an unshakable material basis for their program of nationalism. Before taking up the specific arguments of the Spartacus, it is necessary to outline some basic features of capitalist production, so as to focus on the qualitative transformation in the structure of the world economy, signified by globalization. Capital, Marx explained, exists in three forms, money capital, productive capital, and commodity capital. The process of capitalist production and the accumulation of surplus value which is its driving force involves the continuous transformation of these three forms of capital into one another. In the first stage, capital appears on the market in the form of money. This money capital is used to purchase the means of production, raw materials and machinery, together with labor power. In these transactions, money capital is transformed into productive capital. In the second stage, productive capital is transformed, in the process of production, back into commodity capital with a higher value. The source of this additional or surplus value arises from the difference between the value of the labor power that the capitalist purchased on the market and the value that is added by the workers in the course of the working day. In the third stage, the newly produced commodities are taken back to the market where they are transformed once again into money capital, realizing the surplus value embodied in them, whereupon the process of accumulation resumes. It is through this continuous metamorphosis from money capital to productive capital to commodity capital and then back to money capital that capital accumulation or self-expansion takes place. The source of this expansion being the surplus value extracted from the working class in the process of production. The history of capitalism involves the globalization or internationalization of these three forms of capital. The expansion of capitalist production in the 19th century saw the globalization of capital in the commodity form, as the commodities produced by the factory system and capitalist farms were sold on the expanding world market. By the end of the 19th century, the rise of industrial capitalism brought in its wake an expansion of banking and finance capital, which increasingly became globalized through the development of international investments. However, while both commodity capital and money capital became increasingly globalized, productive capital still remained confined to a great extent within the framework of the national state. While the surplus value extracted from the working class and embodied in commodities was increasingly realized on the world market, and the money capital derived from this process reinvested by the banks and finance houses on an international scale, the actual process of surplus value extraction, the heart of the accumulation process, still took place within a given national state. This is no longer the case. The Spartacus begin their denunciation of the International Committee by disputing the supposed claim that the transfer of production by multinational corporations from North America, West Europe, and Japan to the so-called Third World in recent years represents a profound structural change in the world capitalist system. Furthermore, they insist the idea that the capitalist market is global, that banks and corporations seek out those low-wage countries where they can get the highest return on their investments, that, indeed, the internationalization of finance capital is a dominant feature of the contemporary profit system is hardly new.
Everything here is jumbled and confused in order to try and obscure the essential processes and assert that nothing fundamental has changed in the structure of world capitalism, at least since 1914. In the first place, globalization of production does not merely refer to the transfer of production to so-called third world countries, or simply to a large-scale shift in production by multinational corporations to the third world. These processes, which in themselves are expressions of decisive changes in the structure of world capitalist productions, are only one aspect of the globalization process. Globalization of production refers to the mobility of productive capital engaged in the extraction of surplus value on an international scale. It signifies not merely a quantitative increase in the international activity of capitalist firms, but marks a qualitative transformation in the capitalist mode of production. For the first time in history, productive capital, like commodity capital and money capital before it, is able to move around the world. A Qualitative Change in the Structure of World Capitalism the process of globalization does not signify merely the transfer of production as such. It is rather the disaggregation of previously unified production processes, the dispersal of these processes to different parts of the world, either to advanced capitalist or backwards countries, in order to minimize cost and increase profits, and the integration of these disaggregated processes across national borders and whole continents. That is, for the first time in history, the process of surplus value extraction the essence of capitalist accumulation, has been internationalized. This is the qualitative change in the structure of world capitalism signified by globalization. What is distinctive about globalized production is that a given production process takes place simultaneously on a planetary scale. This could only arise on the basis of a new infrastructure made possible by new communication technologies and more efficient forms of transport. The Spartacus argue that since finance capital has always been invested internationally, there is nothing new in the present situation. This is to ignore the vast quantitative increase of international capital flows in the myriad of new forms it has assumed. The instant transfer of funds, the abolition of exchange controls, the development of global share in bond markets and international futures markets, to name just a few processes, represent, in their totality, a qualitative change. One measure of this transformation is given by the fact that transborder financial flows for the major capitalist countries of the G7 increased by a factor of 10 for the period of 1980 through 1992, as capital was transferred around the globe. Nationally insulated stock markets have all but disappeared. In the decade 1980 through 1990, the volume of cross-border transactions and equities grew at a compound rate of 28% a year, from $120 billion to $1.4 trillion. Over the same period, international bank lending rose from $324 billion to $7.5 trillion, and the international bond market increased in size from $295 billion to $1.6 trillion. The Spartacus maintain that, since trade levels measured by a proportion of GDP only reached their 1913 levels in 1970, the international economy was more globalized 80 years ago. They conveniently ignore one salient fact. A considerable proportion of international trade has been replaced by the international production activities of transnational companies. Figures collected by the United Nations illustrate this process. In 1993, the production of the 170,000 subsidiaries of companies operating outside of their country of origin exceeded by 37% the total volume of world trade. In that year, world trade totaled $4 trillion, while the total of local sales of these transnational companies was $5.5 trillion. The absurdity of the Spartacus claims becomes even more apparent when the changes in the nature of international trade are taken into account. In the previous period, trade involved the purchase and sale of raw materials or finished goods. Today, an increasing amount of world trade consists of transfers of commodities or semi-finished articles within a single transnational company. At least one-third of world trade consists of such transfers. Around one-half of world trade is produced by transnational companies, and some two-thirds of transactions and goods and services combined are dependent on the operations of these companies.
every statistic points to the growing integration of the world economy under the aegis of transnational companies. While the current value of exports increased 3.5 times between 1975 and 1989, the outflow of foreign direct investment FDI, over the same period rose sevenfold. Overall, the annual FDI outflow and inflow almost doubled every five years for the period between 1970 and 1988. In the 1970s, FDI, domestic output, and domestic investment grew at similar rates. From the early 1980s onwards, the rate of growth of FDI began to significantly outpace the other two, and in the period of 1985 through 1990, global FDI grew almost four times faster than domestic output, and more than twice as fast as domestic investment. The rapid increase in foreign direct investment is the statistical expression of a qualitative change in the organization of production by transnational companies, a system in which planning processes within the global corporation are developed in an attempt to counteract the unplanned operation of the market. In the words of a United Nations report, Elements of an extended international production system are gradually emerging as a result of the strategies of TNCS. In that sense, International production can be thought of as performing a wider role than trade, that is, one of moving not only goods and services across borders, but also moving factors of production and organizational methods, skills, and technology under a unified management structure. As a result of that organizational effort, the world economy is being transformed qualitatively. Trading and other linkages are being complemented, if not supplanted, by the linkages at the production level. In an international production system for goods and services, it is increasingly firms transnational corporations that play this coordinating role and that determine participation in the international division of labor rather than arm's length transactions." End quote. Different components of a production process can now be located in different parts of the world in different countries and continents so that costs are minimized. This was not possible previously for two reasons. First, the cost of transportation was prohibitive. That barrier has been greatly reduced by the lowered cost of both sea and air transport. Secondly, the requirements of supervision and the enforcement of standards required that a particular production process be organized within a single factory, or at least in plants in close proximity to each other. Today, different components of a production process can be subcontracted out to firms all over the globe. Rapid and relatively cheap transport, together with computer-based information systems, make possible the separation of what once were necessarily unified processes. In the past, design had to be in close proximity to production. This is no longer the case. Designs can be transferred around the world just as easily as they can be shifted from one room to another. Globalized Production and the Trade Unions One of the central political motivations behind the petty bourgeois ex-radicals' attempts to deny the far-reaching historical significance of globalized production is their desire to defend the trade union form of organization. The Spartacus center their attack on a passage from a report delivered by Socialist Equality Party U.S. National Secretary David North in 1992. Quote, the collapse of the old organizations of the working class is, fundamentally, the product of specific historic and economic conditions. Understanding these conditions does not mean we absolve the leaders of these organizations of responsibility for what has happened. Rather, it enables us to recognize that the rottenness of the leaders is itself only a subjective manifestation of an objective process. The global integration of capitalist production under the aegis of massive transnational corporations and the terminal crisis of the nation-state system have shattered the basic geo-economic foundation upon which the activities of the old organizations of the working class have been based. Nationally based labor organizations are simply incapable of seriously challenging internationally organized corporations." End quote. The chief indictment the Spartacus hurl against the International Committee and North is that, quote, he asserts the trade unions as such have been made impotent by objective changes in the world economy, end quote. 
According to the Spartacus, the betrayals of the working class by the unions are entirely attributable to the union bureaucracy, which has simply capitulated to the bourgeoisie and refuses to organize the union membership to play hardball. The decline of the American labor movement, they declare, is not fundamentally caused by the objective effects of globalization, but by the defeatist and treacherous policies of the AFL-CIO misleaders. The International Committee of the Fourth International is the last to deny the treacherous role of the Union bureaucrats or absolve them of responsibility for the deterioration in the social position of the working class. But it insists that, in the final analysis, the role of the trade union bureaucracy is the expression of deep-seated, objective tendencies bound up, on the one hand, with changes in the structure of the world capitalist economy, and, on the other, with inherent features of the trade union form of organization itself. We shall go further into these questions at a later point. At this stage, let us merely note that, like all subjective explanations, the Spartacus claim that the betrayals of the unions are due simply to the rotten nature of the bureaucracy, and this can, in the end, explain nothing. What is to account for the fact that all sections of the trade union bureaucracy in all countries have adopted the same policies at the same time? How is it that in the past the working class was able to win certain limited material gains through the unions, but is now continually pushed backwards? Does this mean that the vicious anti-communists of the 1950s were less rotten than the union bureaucrats of today? And what is to account for the fact that, whatever their political affiliations, the union bureaucrats play the same role? In an attempt to back up their assertion that the International Committee is preaching defeatism and capitulation before the propaganda campaign of the corporations and their political spokesmen, and providing a rationalization for the betrayals of the trade union bureaucracy, the Spartacus cite the following passage from a report delivered by Socialist Equality Party Australia National Secretary Nick Beams. To the extent that the extraction of surplus value still took place within the confines of a given state, it was possible to apply pressure to capital via the national state for reforms and concessions to the working class. This was the program of the trade union and labor bureaucracies. This is no longer possible. End quote. Commenting on this passage, the Spartacus reveal the nationalist orientation which forms the basis of their attack on the International Committee. Quote, In other words, the Northites maintain it is no longer possible for the working class to defend itself against the predations of capital through strikes or other actions, regardless of the tactics and policies pursued. End quote. Here, we have one of the axioms of the politics of all forms of petty bourgeois radicalism, the identification of the class struggle with the national-based trade union forms that it assumed in the post-war period. The International Committee has explained that the era of national reformism in which the working class sought to maintain and improve its social position through the application of industrial and political pressure on nationally-based employers and the national state is over. According to the Spartacus, however, this is equivalent to denying that the working class has any means at all for defending its interests whatsoever. In other words, the working class equals the trade unions, the class struggle is the trade union struggle, and to maintain that the economic power of the nation-state has been undermined is to say that the class struggle is over. Having equated the class struggle with the specific, highly constricted national forms it assumed during the post-war boom, the Spartacus must try and prove that it is possible for such struggles to continue. In an attempt to show that globalization of production has nothing to do with the decline of the trade unions, the Spartacus declare, in none of the major strikes which marked the decline and the defeat of the American labor movement in the 1980s, the Patco air traffic controllers, Greyhound bus drivers, Phelps Dodge copper miners, Eastern Airline machinists, Hormel meat packers, did foreign competition or the operations of multinationals abroad play any significant role. Greyhound, Eastern Airlines, and Hormel extract almost all of their surplus labor value from within the confines of the American state. End of declaration. There could hardly be a greater display of intellectual bankruptcy than this. 
In the first place, it should be recalled that the smashing of Patco in 1981, which set the scene for the onslaught that followed, was organized and carried out by the United States government, the political leadership of world capitalism. It followed in the wake of the change in international economic policy organized by U.S. finance capital and initiated by U.S. Federal Reserve Chairman Paul Volcker in 1979, who raised interest rates to their highest ever levels and brought about the deepest recession since the post-war period. Even setting aside this extremely important political fact, the Spartacus analysis displays an ignorance of the workings of the capitalist system, not to speak of Marxist political economy. In Volume 3 of Capital, in the section entitled Equalization of the General Rate of Profit Through the Competition, Marx demonstrated that the profit levels of an individual firm are not determined by how much surplus value that particular corporation extracts from the workers it directly exploits. Rather, each firm receives a portion of the total surplus value extracted from the working class according to its share of the total capital used to extract it. This division of surplus value in the form of profit is a social process which takes place through the competitive struggle between the different sections of capital. Those sections of capital that produce at below average costs will receive greater than average profits. Those whose costs are higher than the average will receive profits at a rate below the social average. These averages themselves are subject to change as new production processes and techniques are developed. A production process that resulted in average or below average costs at one point in time will, as new methods are developed, result in higher than average costs in another period. In the past, when firms operated to a great extent within national markets, the struggle over the appropriation of surplus value took place primarily within the confines of a given national state. The globalization of production has produced a new situation. Regardless of the percentages of their revenues that firms derive from the national market, costs, efficiency, productivity of labor, the rate of profit are today all determined on an international scale. It is irrelevant if a particular firm operates on a global, national, or even only on a regional or city-wide basis. The cost structure it confronts is the outcome of world economic processes that operate quite independently of it. Even where goods and services are produced and sold within a national market, they have to meet standards and costs which are set globally. It has been calculated that in the largest domestic market, the United States, whereas in the 1960s only 4% of domestic production was subject to international competition, today that figure stands at more than 70%. Furthermore, whatever the market for their goods or services, all companies are subject to the dictates of international capital and financial markets. Those firms which do not meet international cost standards, that is, internationally determined profit rates, will find that capital is more expensive. Capitalism and the Origins of the Nation-State the Spartacists advance a militaristic and ultimately subjectivist view of the nation-state. According to their conception, the nation-state is not the political expression of a definite stage in the historical development of the productive forces, but merely a political military apparatus developed by the bourgeoisie to maintain its economic domination. The capitalist nation-state was by no means simply the product of military conflicts, it arose out of profound economic changes, bound up with trade and the increasing use of money, which undermined the feudal regimes. Military force was not the primary factor. As Engels explained, Long before the new field pieces shot breaches into the knightly castle walls, these had already been undermined by money. Indeed, gunpowder was, so to say, only an executor in the service of money. Money was the great political leveler in the hands of the burgerdom. The principal driving force behind the formation of the nation-state was economic. The growth of capitalist production and the accumulation of capital required the development of a national market and the breaking down of guild privileges, political restrictions, local customs barriers and tariffs, which hemmed in production on all sides. The development of capitalist production drew together backward villages and provinces. It linked the provinces with the cities and created a national market, bound together with a common language, laws, and a common currency. 
However, the development of the productive forces did not cease with the formation of the national state and national markets. In its further development, capitalist production began to transcend the nation-state framework. The whole history of the 20th century, beginning with the intensification of imperialist rivalries and the outbreak of World War in 1914, is bound up with this developing contradiction. World War I, as all the Marxists of the time explained, signified that the productive forces had outgrown the limits of the nation-state. The present war, Trotsky wrote in 1915, is at bottom a revolt of the forces of production against the political form of nation and state. It means the collapse of the national state as an independent economic unit. The real, objective significance of the war is the breakdown of the present national economic centers and the substitution of a world economy in its stead. This contradiction has been raised to a new peak of intensity by the development of globalized production. The national state continues to play a political and military role, just as did the feudal absolutist state at the dawn of capitalist development. But, like its forerunner, its economic significance has been undermined, and it is precisely this economic decline that creates the conditions for its overthrow. In their apotheosis of the nation-state, the Spartacus based their politics not on Lenin, but rather hearken back to an earlier figure, the petty bourgeois radical Eugen During, who likewise insisted on the primacy of political and military force over economic contradictions. Engel's remarks directed against the petty bourgeois conceptions of During and his fascination with the military apparatus of the bourgeoisie apply with no less force to the Spartacus. And if the bourgeoisie now make their appeal to force in order to save the collapsing economic situation from the final crash, this only shows that they are laboring under the same delusion as Air During, the delusion that the political conditions are the decisive cause of the economic situation. This only shows that they imagine, just as Air During does, that by making use of the primary, the direct political force, they can remodel those facts of the second order, the economic situation, and its inevitable development, and that therefore the economic consequences of the steam engine and modern industry driven by it, of world trade and the banking and credit developments of the present day, can be blown out of existence by them with croup guns and Mauser rifles. In their insistence on the historical viability of the nation-state, the Spartacus undertake a rewriting of history of capitalist development. Quote, North's view of the capitalists as an international class, they write, flies in the face of the Marxist understanding that the bourgeoisie cannot transcend national interests. End quote. Behind this proposition lies a total falsification of the history of capitalism. The Spartacus mechanical conception is that the bourgeoisie was a product of the national state, while the world market was developed through the aggregation of various national markets, like a set of building blocks. The real course of historical development bears no resemblance to this. The bourgeoisie arose in Europe before the formation of the nation-state, and in its trade, banking, and other commercial activities, including manufacturing, it functioned as an international class within a framework of the absolutist feudal regimes. Historically, the international market arose prior to the development of national markets, and indeed was one of the factors leading to the breakdown of localized production based on feudal relations and the development of commodity production for the market. The capitalist nation-state arose out of a complex historical process in which the bourgeoisie sought to develop the political structures necessary to defend its property and economic interests and wealth, which in turn was a product of the growth of the world market. In other words, the bourgeoisie is, at the same time, the creator of the world market and the creator of the nation-state system. The logic of capital is universal. Its inherent drive to accumulate brings it into conflict with all previous forms of production. Capital strives to break down every barrier and cross every border in the relentless drive for accumulation. The nation-state form, however, is based on the erection of borders and barriers, for they define its authority and jurisdiction. 
The capitalist system is founded on this objective contradiction between the striving of capital to expand globally on the one hand and the limits imposed by the nation-state on the other. This contradiction, which has been inherent in capitalism since its birth, has reached explosive proportions in the 20th century, giving rise to two world wars. The bourgeoisie cannot resolve this contradiction. It cannot do away with the nation-state system in which its property is rooted. Neither can it confine the productive forces to the limits imposed by national boundaries. The bourgeoisie is driven by the objective logic of capital itself. Therefore, in its economic activity, it has to continuously transcend the nation-state framework and undermine it. It is not the analysis of the International Committee, but rather the drivel produced by the Spartacists which flies in the face of the Marxist understanding. But I guess you can't fault them for being unfamiliar with such obscure Marxists like Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels who, in one of their deep tracks, dropped this little gem. The need of a constantly expanding market for its products chases the bourgeoisie over the whole surface of the globe. It must nestle everywhere, settle everywhere, establish connections everywhere. The bourgeoisie has, through its exploitation of the world market, given a cosmopolitan character to production and consumption in every country. To the great chagrin of reactionists, it has drawn from under the feet of industry the national ground on which it stood. All the old established national industries have been destroyed or are daily being destroyed. They are dislodged by new industries whose introduction becomes a life and death question for all civilized nations, by industries that no no longer work up indigenous raw materials, but raw materials drawn from the remotest zones. Industries whose products are consumed not only at home, but in every quarter of the globe. In place of the old wants, satisfied by the productions of the country, we find new wants, requiring for their satisfaction the products of distant lands and climes. In place of the old local and national seclusion and self-sufficiency, we have intercourse in every direction, universal interdependence of nations, as in material, so in intellectual production. The intellectual creations of individual nations become common property. National one-sidedness and narrow one-mindedness becomes more and more impossible, and from the numerous national and local literatures there arises a worldly literature. The stockholders who care. Because they assert the primacy of political and military considerations over basic economic driving forces of the process of capital accumulation, the Spartacists present a completely subjective view of the workings of the capitalist economy. Thus, they write that, according to the International Committee's perspective, quote, Corporations like IBM, Siemens, Simons, whatever the fuck, Toshiba are devoted solely to maximizing their profits on a global scale. Their directors and stockholders supposedly don't care whether their actions strengthen the American, German, and Japanese bourgeois states, end quote. It's not a question of whether the stockholders and directors care about the strength of the national state or any other question. The process of capitalist production, as Marx demonstrated, is not driven forward by the subjective wishes or intentions of the owners of capital, but by the objective logic of the process of capital accumulation itself. This is not some aspect of Marxism, but it is central to Marx's analysis of commodity fetishism, which forms the core of capital. The functions fulfilled by the capitalist, Marx wrote, are no more than functions of capital viz. the valorization of value, by living labor, executed consciously and willingly. The capitalist functions only as personified capital. Major corporations are forced to maximize their profits without regard to the impact on their own national state, or risk being put out of business by more competitive rivals. This regime is enforced by the continuous movement of finance capital. The shareholders' funds of major corporations are no longer dominated by the holdings of individual capitalists, but are comprised of investments by banks, life insurance funds, pension and superannuation funds, mutual funds, and other forms of accumulated savings. 
These funds scour the globe in search of the best rate of return, forcing corporations, whatever may be the wishes of their directors, to continuously develop their production methods to secure a competitive rate of return on shareholders' funds. Those firms which fail to do this, that is, maximize their profits on an international scale, irrespective of the consequences for the national state in which they originated, will find that their share price declines as the funds of the leading savings institutions move out to seek higher rates of return elsewhere. Consequently, the corporation will find that it has to pay a higher premium on capital to attract funds or higher interest rates to the banks as its assets are devalued, and it will become a target for a takeover or merger if it is not forced out of business altogether by its more profitable rivals. This analysis of the objective logic of capitalist production has formed the core of the Marxist critique of all those social reformist nostrums that have maintained that the worst ex excesses of capitalist production can be eliminated, and its socially destructive character modified through workers' buyouts or the placing of more socially responsible directors on the boards. While the Spartacus positions are nonsense from the standpoint of a scientific analysis of the workings of the capitalist economy, they do have a very definite class logic. If boards of directors can be made to care about the fate of their own nation-state irrespective of the consequences for profit maximization, then they can be made to care about other issues as well, including the provision of rising wages for the working class or increased social welfare provisions. Indeed, a whole social reformist agenda can be advanced. And now we've uncovered the political perspective of this analysis, rejecting the primacy of global economic forces and stressing the attachment of corporations to their home base, they are oriented to sections of the bourgeoisie who care about the nation. Spartacus is not alone in this regard. Some of their cohorts in the radical milieu have marked out even more clearly the direction in which they are heading. The perspective of all of them is summed up in a recent book by Paul Hurst and Graham Thompson, two representatives of the British middle-class left. Their globalization in question has become something of a bible for these tendencies. The authors describe their perspective as a mixture of skepticism about global economic processes and optimism about the possibilities of control of the international economy and the viability of national political strategies. They acknowledge that social goals such as full employment have become problematic, but contend that this should not lead us to dismiss or ignore the forms of control and social improvement that could be achieved relatively rapidly with a modest change in aptitudes on the part of key elites. It is thus essential to persuade reformers on the left and conservatives who care for the fabric of their societies that we are not helpless before uncontrollable global processes. In Britain, where Hurst and Thompson write, this perspective would mean an orientation to sections of the Eurosceptic Tory party, anti-EU figures such as the late billionaire Sir James Goldsmith and his referendum party, as well as sections of the Labour Party, the trade union bureaucracy, and the nationalists of Arthur Scargill's Socialist Labour Party. In the United States, the Spartacus have already taken part in a similar front during the anti-NAFTA campaign, which saw the formation of a de facto alliance embracing the AFL-CIO bureaucracy, the neo-fascist demagogue Pat Buchanan, billionaire Roz Perot, the consumer campaigner Ralph Nader, and the petty bourgeois radical left. The Spartacus sought to integrate themselves into this alliance and curry favor with sections of the bureaucracy and the bourgeoisie by adapting to their economic nationalism. This gravitation to the extreme right wing is neither accidental nor unique. The middle class left long ago rejected the working class as a revolutionary force. It relied on the labor bureaucracies, Stalinism, and the nationalist movements to restrain imperialism internationally and to pressure the ruling class for reforms at home. With the decline of these old leaderships, the left groups cast about for new social forces with which to pressure the state. Their nationalist outlook brings them into alignment with the most backward and provincial sections of the bourgeoisie, whose reactionary political spokesmen from Le Pen in France to Buchanan in the U.S. likewise denounce globalization.
We have seen how the Spartacus explained the decline of the trade unions as a result of the subjective motivation of the union officials and their refusal to play hardball. Now the circle is completed. The major corporations are not driven by global economic forces, but by the subjective attachments of their directors and stockholders to their home base. Consequently, the two can come together on the national soil as the trade unions apply pressure to the major corporations for reforms and concessions. An alliance of the trade union bureaucracy with sections of the bourgeoisie who care about the nation and are concerned to ensure that its strength is maintained. That is what the political program of the petty bourgeois ex-radicals amounts to. It shares much in common with that of the modern-day fascist and ultra-nationalist movements which have sprung up in response to the globalization of production. International Finance versus the Capitalist State the same subjectivist outlook combined with a petty bourgeois fascination with the military apparatus of the nation-state is exemplified when the Spartacus turn to the question of finance capital. They begin by citing a speech by David North, in which he referred to the increased power of finance capital as follows. Not even in the height of its glory did the British Empire possess even a fraction of the power over its colonial subjects that the modern institutions of world imperialism, such as the World Bank, the IMF, GATT, and the EC routinely exercise over the supposedly independent states of Latin America, Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. This presentation of an undeniable fact of economic life expressed in a whole series of statistics evoked a furious response from the Spartacus. The idea that the World Bank and IMF exercised greater power over the workers and peasants of India than did the British colonial army and police is pacifistic nonsense. Here again, the Spartacus reduce all historical processes to the exercise of military force. The plundering of the wealth of India did not take place primarily through military, but rather economic means. The chief instruments for the destruction of the Indian economy and its subordination to the British Empire were not guns, but cheap cotton textiles and the railways. The lifeblood of capitalist productive activity is not military power, but international finance. To secure the means to finance investments, build infrastructure, and operate basic facilities, the government of the semi-colonial countries have to implement the so-called structural adjustment programs of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. These programs, initiated in the mid-1980s following the Mexican debt crisis, have proven to be the most effective method for sucking the lifeblood out of whole regions of the globe and transferring vast amounts of wealth through the automatic workings of the financial markets into the coffers of the major banks and transnational corporations. The extent of this financial transfer can be seen from the following statistics for just a single year. In 1992, the interest on debt due from the poorer nations to the banks and international lending institutions was $125 billion, while the estimated return on the investment of the transnationals, calculated at 15% of the capital stock of $420 billion, was $64 billion, making a total transfer of $189 billion. Even after deducing the $59 billion granted in so-called aid, the total transfer was $130 billion. Even this staggering figure fails to give the full picture. Added to this must be the effect of declining raw material prices, the impact of transfer pricing policies of the transnational companies, and the charges for the use of technology and intellectual property rights. Recent events have rendered their own judgment on the profundities of Spartacus in relation to the ability of finance capital and its institutions to impose their will not only on colonies, but on nominally independent states. Presidents and prime ministers from Thailand to South Korea and even Japan, the second largest national economy in the world, have, over the past several months, received object lessons from the relative power of the International Monetary Fund and national states. The photograph 
published in newspapers from Jakarta to Washington showing Indonesian strongman Suharto putting his signature to the IMF bailout terms while IMF managing director Kemdesis looks over his shoulder is worth, as the saying goes, a thousand words. The Spartacus glorification of the nation-state is summed up in their attitude to the role of international agencies of finance capital, such as the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. The view that transnational corporations, they write, transcend the nation-state system leads to the notion that certain international economic agencies like the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund have now become a kind of world capitalist government. No less absurd, they continue, is the idea that these institutions are powers unto themselves, independent of the imperialist nation-states. These international agencies act at the behest and in the interests of the major capitalist powers, not autonomously of them, and certainly not above them. For the Spartacus there really is no reality higher than the national market and the national bourgeois state, and insofar as the global financial system and international financial institutions are concerned, they are treated as the sum of national markets or the instrument of the domination of national states. This fixation on the nation-state, for all its superficial radicalism, has nothing in common with Marxism, which, as Trotsky explained, takes its point of departure from the world economy, not as a sum total of national parts, but as a mighty and independent reality which has been created by the international division of labor. The Spartacus continually invoke Lenin and his work Imperialism in their attack on the International Committee, but Lenin's work cannot be employed to defend the dominant role of the national state. On the contrary, he was explaining the dominant and global role of finance capital in the imperialist epoch. Far from the national state playing the dominant role, Lenin maintained the exact opposite. Finance capital is such a great, such a divisive, you might say, force in all economic and in all international relations that it is capable of subjecting, and actually does subject, to itself even states enjoying the fullest political independence. That was Lenin examining world capitalism at the beginning of this process, and the trends he identified have since developed on an enormous scale. The national state and the banks are both creations of the bourgeoisie, and their history is, to a great extent, intertwined. However, the power of the banks is not derived from the nation state, but from the control of credit and finance, the lifeblood of the capitalist economy. Far from the one-way relationship that the Spartacus present the banks as the subservient instruments of the national state, the real relationship has been far stormier. The history of the banking and financial system in the post-war period can be said to be one of a continual struggle by the banks to free themselves from control by the national state, and the rise of international finance capital and global financial markets has taken place in direct opposition to the state. The growth of the international financial system in the post-war period is inseparably bound up with the history of the international monetary system established at the Bretton Woods Conference in 1944. From almost the day the United States entered the war, leading officials in the Roosevelt administration were concerned with the development of a viable post-war financial structure. There was a realization, born of the bitter experiences of the preceding two decades that unless the conditions for an expanding world market were established, tariff and import controls dismantled, and a stable international system of payments established, the world economy would rapidly plunge back into depression, giving rise to the threat of social revolution. The Rise and Fall of the Bretton Woods System the Bretton Woods Conference established a highly regulated international currency system. The United States dollar was established as the international currency fixed at the rate of $35 per ounce of gold. The cornerstone of the system was the establishment of fixed exchange rates between the major currencies. 
In order to prevent the type of competitive devaluations and disruptive currency fluctuations which had caused such devastation in the 1930s, the International Monetary Fund was established to provide funds for those countries experiencing difficulties in their balance of payments. The International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the World Bank, was set up to provide funds for long-term loans for the reconstruction of the economies of Western Europe. The establishment of a system of fixed currency rates necessarily presupposed the regulation of international capital movements by the central banks and the political authorities of the nation-state. The history of the demise of the post-war monetary order is also the history of the breakdown of this national control over finance capital and the rise of an international financial system. For the Bretton Woods system to function, the United States had to supply dollar liquidity to the rest of the world through the financing of private capital investment by U.S. corporations and government loans and aid. These dollars were utilized, in turn, to finance the balance of trade surplus of the United States with the rest of the world. Embodied in this arrangement was a fundamental contradiction. It was based on the economic supremacy of the United States over its rival capitalist powers on the one hand, while on the other, the consequences of its operation were to strengthen the rest of the advanced capitalist nations and relatively weaken the position of the United States. These contradictions first began to emerge towards the end of the 1960s in the form of a gold crisis. Underpinning the entire system was the guarantee by the United States that dollars would be redeemed out of the gold stock at Fort Knox at the rate of $35 per ounce. In the first years of the 1950s, the amount of gold leaving Fort Knox was negligible, as dollars were always in demand to pay for much-needed exports from the U.S., but as European and Japanese industry began to revive and then expand, there was a diminishing relative demand for U.S. exports, and the stock of dollars outside the U.S. began to grow relative to the gold that backed them. In 1958, for the first time, the dollars held by foreigners exceeded the U.S. gold stock. The decade of the 1960s was marked by a deepening crisis of the Bretton Woods system. American gold stocks, which stood at $18 billion in the 1960s, were declining at a rate between $0.5 billion and $1 billion per annum. But in the year 1964-65, gold stocks fell by $1.5 billion as the de Gaulle administration in France opened a war against the U.S. dollar. By 1968, the gold stock had fallen perilously close to the level of 10 billion, considered the minimum necessary for the functioning of the Bretton Woods system. U.S. gold stocks were now around half of what they had been in 1950. In response to the mounting gold crisis, President Johnson attempted to impose a series of restrictions on the outflow of American capital in 1968, but the very imposition of these measures led the U.S. banks to discover ways to evade exchange controls. Their actions laid the foundations for what has now become an international financial system operating outside of the control of any national state or group of central banks. The origins of this new system lie in the emergence of the so-called Euro-dollar market in the 1950s. This consisted of initially small amounts of dollars held in the European banks and the European branches of American banks. So long as the Bretton Woods system operated relatively smoothly, the bulk of these dollars were used to purchase exports from the United States. But... Towards the end of the 1950s, as the demand for U.S. exports declined relatively, the pool of euro dollars began to grow. This development led to the emergence of a euro dollar lending market, the floating of loans by banks from their holdings of dollars outside the U.S. The euro dollar market was to expand rapidly in the latter part of the 1960s as the U.S. administration sought to control the outflow of dollars from America and multinational companies eager to acquire funds to invest in Europe and banks equally eager to accommodate their demands sought ways to escape these controls. With the final breakdown of the Bretton Woods system in the period of 1971 through 73, 
The so-called euro currency market soon comprised a world financial market dealing in currencies outside the nation state that had issued that currency. And the greatest single force bringing this about was the U.S. multinational corporations and banks, which sought ways to undermine the attempted controls of the most powerful imperialist state. There are many examples from recent history showing how the national state has had to submit to the pressure placed upon it by international financial markets. The Callahan government in 1975-76, the Mitterrand government in 82-83, Brazil and Mexico in the 1980s. One of the most recent experiences was the withdrawal of Britain from the European currency arrangements in 1992, in which British banks played a key role in the sell-off of the pound. The Spartacus insistence that the international financial institutions are merely the agencies of the imperialist states flies in the face of one of the central features of the capitalist economy, the basic conflict between the unbounded geography of profit accumulation and the bounded political geography of national states. Like the rest of the middle class radical fraternity who were fascinated by Mao's slogan, all power grows out of the barrel of a gun, the Spartacists are dismissive of the financial power exercised by the IMF and other financial institutions because they do not possess weapons and an army. Marx and the Iron Law of Wages one of the key propositions advanced by the Spartacus in their defense of the trade union form of organization is that any examination of the objective effects of the globalization of capitalist production in driving down the wages and social conditions of the working class is tantamount to adopting a present-day version of what in the 19th century was called the Iron Law of Wages. Because this forms such a vital component of their political perspective, it is necessary to reveal in some detail the distortions and outright falsifications that they make. The underlying thesis of the Iron Law was that any attempt by workers to increase wages by trade union or other forms of action would result in a general rise in the prices of commodities, thereby wiping out the effect of the increase in wages. Marx took up this conception in his pamphlet, Wages, Price, and Profit, written in 1865 in reply to George Weston, a member of the General Council of the First International. The Spartacus never review what Marx actually wrote, nor the social and economic context in which he examined this question. Nonetheless, they charge that, in analyzing the objective impact of globalized production on living standards, and the incapacity of the trade unions to sustain even the most basic interests of the working class, the International Committee has reverted to the iron law of wages and abandoned a basic Marxist position. In his address to the First International, Marx showed that the Iron Law, as advanced by Weston, was based on the fallacious conception that the prices of commodities were determined and regulated by wages. While Weston's propositions were the immediate subject of Marx's analysis, his real target was the followers of Proudhon, whose politics exerted considerable influence in the French and other sections of the International. The social base of Proudhonism consisted of the petty bourgeois artisans and craftsmen, especially in Paris, who still worked outside the major industrial factories. The narrow outlook of this social layer was reflected in the main planks of the Proudhonist program, opposition to trade union action, opposition to political action to secure regulation by the state of working conditions, opposition to women entering the workforce, and the establishment of a people's bank. The basic program of Proudhonism, reflecting the interests of its petty bourgeois artisanal social base, was not the overthrow of the social relations of capitalism, but rather the removal of monopolistic constrictions on the operation of the free market, together with the provision of large amounts of cheap credit to small producers through the People's Bank. Marx regarded the defeat of the petty bourgeois anarchist conceptions of Proudhonism as essential for the development of the workers' movement, which was being brought into being by the growth of capitalist industrialization. The Proudhonists were the political spokesmen for social forces that were being pushed back by changes in the capitalist economy.
Here, there is a direct parallel with the role of the Spartacus. Like the Prudonis, they speak for petty bourgeois layers whose social existence is bound up with economic, social, and political relations that are being undermined by vast changes in the capitalist economy. Marx had conducted a continuous exposure of the petty bourgeois illusions of Prudonism since writing The Poverty of Philosophy in 1847. At the time of his reply to the Proudhonist conceptions of Weston, he had made one of his most important discoveries, the origins of surplus value, which revealed how it was that the exploitation of the working class necessarily arose out of the very operation of the market. The value of any commodity, he explained, was determined by the amount of socially necessary labor contained within it, that is, by the time taken on average to produce it. What was commonly described as the value of labor was in fact the value of labor power, the capacity of the laborer to work. Like any other commodity, its value was determined by the quantity of labor needed to reproduce it. In other words, the value of labor power was the value of the commodities needed to sustain the worker and his family. The origin of surplus value, Marx explained, lay in the fact that the value of labor power was vastly different from the value which the worker added in the course of the working day, whereas the average amount of necessities to sustain the laborer and his family might require six hours for their reproduction, the laborer engaged in twelve hours of work for the capitalist. This difference formed the basis of the unpaid labor or surplus value extracted from the worker in the course of the working day. On the basis of this analysis, Marx explained that an increase in wages would not bring about a general increase in commodity prices, rather it would alter the distribution of the social produce between profits and wages. Consequently, between the maximum level of profits determined by the minimum wage level and the minimum level of profits, an immense scale of variations is possible. The actual level of wages at any point in time is determined by the continuous struggle between capital and labor, with the matter resolving itself into a question of the respective powers of the combatants. This is a point at which the Spartacus leave off their presentation of the issue in order to introduce their falsifications. Having presented the Iron Law of Wages as a doctrine that wages could not be permanently raised above a fixed level regardless of the actions, economic and or political, taken by the working class, the Spartacus imply that Marx stated the opposite. In fact, as Marx makes clear at the outset, he hopes that Weston will find me agreeing with what appears to me the just idea lying at the bottom of his thesis. This just idea is that, in the long run, the economic and political action of the working class cannot permanently raise the level of wages irrespective of objective economic conditions. Having shown that the struggle over wages comes down to a question of the strength of the combatants, Marx then points to the processes which determine its outcome. He points out, in opposition to Weston, that farmers, for example, faced with an increase in the wages of agricultural laborers, were not able to increase the price of corn and had to submit to its fall. They countered the rise in wages not by increasing prices, but through the introduction of machinery and more scientific methods. They thereby diminished the demand for labor by increasing its productive power, and made the agricultural population again relatively redundant. This is the general method in which a reaction, quicker or slower, of capital against a rise of wages takes place in the old settled countries. Ricardo justly remarked that machinery is in constant competition with labor, and can often be only introduced when the price of labor has reached a certain height but the appliance of machinery is but one of the many methods for increasing the productive powers of labor. This very same development, which makes common labor relatively redundant, simplifies on the other hand skilled labor and thus depreciates it. Marx went on to explain, in the course of development of industry, the growth of capital far outpaced the growth of of demand for labor, and that, while the demand for labor increases, it will only increase in a constantly diminishing ratio as compared with the increase of capital. 
watched the Spartacus attempt to invoke Marx as a supporter of their reformist thesis, that through trade union action the working class is able to secure a permanent increase in wages and living standards. In fact, Marx draws the opposite conclusions. Having pointed to the reaction of capital to an increase in wages, he writes, These few hints will suffice to show that the very development of modern industry must progressively turn the scale in favor of the capitalist against the working man, and consequently the general tendency of capitalist production is not to raise but to sink the average standard of wages or push the value of labor more or less to its minimum limit. Having drawn out the main tendency of development, Marx then made clear that this by no means implied that workers should renounce resistance against the encroachments of capital or, quote, abandon their attempts at making the best of the occasional chances for their temporary improvement, end quote. But Marx insisted, quote, the working class ought not to exaggerate to themselves the ultimate working of these everyday struggles. They ought not to forget that they are fighting with effects, but not with the causes of those effects. That they are retarding the downward movement, but not changing its direction. That they are applying palliatives, not curing the malady. They ought, therefore, not be exclusively absorbed in these unavoidable guerrilla fights incessantly springing up from the never-ceasing encroachments of capital or changes in the market. They ought to understand that, with all the miseries it imposes upon them, the present system simultaneously engenders the material conditions and social forms necessary for an economical reconstruction of society. Instead of the conservative motto, a fair day's wage for a fair day's work, they ought to inscribe on their banner the revolutionary watchword, abolition of the wages system. The Spartacus attempt to base their indictment of the International Committee on one of the conclusions drawn by Marx from his analysis. Trade unions work well as centers of resistance against the encroachments of capital, wrote Marx. They fail generally from limiting themselves to a guerrilla war against the effects of the existing system, instead of trying to change it, instead of using their organized forces as a lever for the final emancipation of the working class, that is to say, the ultimate abolition of the wages system. According to the Spartacus, the Northites now openly repudiate this basic Marxist position. They maintain that trade unions can no longer function as centers of resistance to the predations of capital, and they counterpose a socialist transformation to the defense of workers' interests within capitalism. The thesis that trade unions work well as centers of resistance against the encroachments of capital is not some kind of basic Marxist proposition. It was a conditional assessment by Marx at a definite point in time, the mid-1860s, when trade unions were only just beginning to make their appearance in a number of countries. It was an assessment made at a definite historical stage in the development of capitalism, not some kind of absolute pronouncement. But, even as he emphasized the importance of the unions, Marx pointed to their inherent limitations. Already by the end of the 19th century, those limitations were coming to the fore and were being analyzed by the most prominent Marxists of the day, while by the end of the 1930s, Trotsky pointed to the growing tendency of the unions to become incorporated into the apparatus of the capitalist state, a tendency that accelerated greatly during World War II and during the post-war boom, when the trade unions functioned as co-administrators of the social welfare state. However, when the post-war boom came to an end in the mid-1970s, and capital changed its orientation from one of limited concessions to the working class to never-ending reductions in real wages and working conditions, the trade unions, far from working well, proved completely incapable of resisting capital's encroachments. The record in all the major capitalist countries is the same over the past several decades. Real wages have declined, the working class has suffered a series of defeats, and conditions won in an earlier period have been severely cut back. Not only have real wages been reduced, but social welfare provisions are being cut back in all the major capitalist countries as a direct consequence of the globalization of production. The bourgeoisie is now able to relocate different sections of the production process, not only to take advantage of lower wages, but to minimize taxation payments, 
The capitalist nation-states are consequently in a competition with one another to attract transnational corporations to their territory by reducing tax and other payments. Furthermore, the globalization of finance means that even where corporations are required to pay tax, they can avoid most of it. A recent report by the Australian Tax Office, for example, concluded that multinational companies, both domestic and foreign-based, paid virtually no company tax at all. The pressure for lower wages comes not only from traditional low-cost areas. As one recent study concludes, the alignment of labor conditions across countries does not take place only because of competition from low-cost areas. It also forces Europe, America, and Japan to converge. The pressures towards greater flexibility of the labor market and toward the reversal of the welfare state in Western Europe come less from the pressures derived from East Asia than from competition with the United States. It will become increasingly difficult for Japanese firms to continue life employment practices for the privileged 30% of its labor force if they have to compete in an open economy with American competitors practicing flexible employment." End quote. The Rejection of a Revolutionary Perspective Apart from being refuted by empirical facts, the Spartacus thesis that trade unions work well as centers of resistance to the demands of capital raises issues of long-term historical perspective. If, as they maintain, there is no objective reason why the trade unions cannot continuously carry forward the interests of the working class against the predations of capitalism and maintain the defense of workers' interests within capitalism, then there is clearly no objective necessity for the overthrow of capitalism. There is no material necessity for the working class to advance the struggle for socialism because its material interests can be met within the framework of the profit system by trade unions that work well provided their leadership is sufficiently militant. Consequently, the socialist revolution is not an objective material necessity, but merely an idea or a utopia. The revolutionary party is not the necessary instrument through which the working class emancipates itself, it is, at most, a propaganda society for this utopia. In other words, the Spartacus denunciation of the International Committee is a regurgitation of the same arguments thrown forward by every Union bureaucrat since the formation of the Unions. The defense of the immediate material interests of the working class requires nothing more than the trade unions. The deep-seated hostility of the Spartacus to the Socialist Revolution emerges clearly in their objections to the following passage from an article by Nick Beams, which explained the connection between the immediate struggles of the working class and the Socialist program. Quote, in order to defend even the most minimal conditions, the simple and most ordinary demands, the working class is confronted with the necessity of overthrowing the social relations based on capital and wage labor determined by the capitalist market, through which the appropriation of surplus value takes place. The Spartacus object. At one glance, this may seem like a terribly revolutionary position. In fact, it indicates a defeatist and abstentionist attitude towards the actual struggles of the working class, without which all talk of overthrowing the social relations based on capital and wage labor is empty rhetoric. This counterposing of the actual struggles of the working class to the struggle for a socialist perspective is the hallmark of every opportunist tendency and has been the stock and trade of the reformist and trade union bureaucracy throughout this century, last century, and well before. The position advanced by Beams, that the defense of the most minimal conditions of the working class raises the necessity for the struggle for a program aimed at the conquest of political power, does not imply an abstention from the struggles erupting in the working class. Rather, it indicates, and this is where the objections of the Spartacus arise, what must be the attitude of Marxists towards these struggles. The necessity for the working class to break out of the stranglehold of the trade union bureaucracy which seeks to subordinate it to the rule of capital. The International Committee raises before the working class the new tasks with which it is confronted as a result of changed objective conditions.
The real practitioners of abstentionism and capitulation are those who maintain that the working class can simply continue as before, when clearly the entire situation has been transformed. Not only are there no further concessions, the bourgeoisie is striving to claw back all the concessions it was forced to make in the past. This means there can be no actual struggle to defend the conditions of the working class outside of a political struggle which aims at the conquest of political power. The working class cannot defend anything unless it challenges everything, that is, the domination of capital and its drive for profit over the whole of society. The attitude of the International Committee to the actual struggles of the working class is based on the program of Marxists throughout last century and this century and before. When the opportunists of the Bernstein School sought to separate the actual struggles of the working class for improved wages and working conditions from the overthrow of capitalism and the socialist revolution, Luxembourg replied that reforms were, in every sense, a byproduct of revolution, either of past revolutionary struggles or of an ongoing revolutionary movement. In the 1930s, in his critique of the program of the French Communist Party, Trotsky directly addressed the separation of the immediate demands of the working class from the struggle for political power. The program was crowned, he pointed out, by the following statement. While fighting every day in order to relieve the toiling masses from the misery which the capitalist regime imposes on them, the communists emphasize that the final emancipation can be gained only by the abolition of the capitalist regime and the setting up of the dictatorship of the proletariat. This formula, which was invoked by the social democracy half a century before, had become obsolete by the time of World War I, but was now being employed by the Stalinists in the name of Marx and Lenin. When they emphasize that the final emancipation can be obtained only by the abolition of the capitalist regime, they manipulate this elementary truth in order to deceive the workers, for they give the workers the idea that a certain alleviation, even an important alleviation in their condition, can be obtained within the framework of the present regime. The present-day Spartacus repeat almost word for word the positions of the Stalinists more than 60 years ago. They admit that of course the final emancipation of the working class requires the overthrow of capitalism, and that a revolutionary party, not a trade union, is necessary for that task, but the socialist program is consigned to the indefinite and cloudy future and has no bearing on the actual struggles of the working class, for these involve the defense of the workers' interests within capitalism by means of the trade unions. In opposition to the Stalinists, Trotsky explained, the Marxist political thesis must be the following. While explaining constantly to the masses that rotting capitalism has no place either for the alleviation of their situation or even for the maintenance of their customary level of misery, while putting openly before the masses the task of the social revolution as the immediate task of our day, while mobilizing the workers for the conquest of power, while defending the workers' organizations with help of the workers' militia, the communists or the socialists will at the same time lose no opportunity to snatch this or that that partial concession from the enemy, or at least prevent the further lowering of the living standard of the workers. This approach was further developed by Trotsky in the Transitional Program, the founding document of the Fourth International, written in 1938. The Fourth International, Trotsky explained, does not discard the program of the old minimal demands, to the degree to which these have preserved at least part of their forcefulness. Indefatigably, it defends the democratic rights and social conquests of the workers, but it carries on this day-to-day -day work within the framework of the correct actual, that is, revolutionary, perspective. Insofar as the old partial minimal demands of the masses clash with the destructive and degrading tendencies of decadent capitalism, and this occurs at each step, the Fourth International advances a system of transitional demands, the essence of which is contained in the fact that ever more openly and decisively they will be directed against the very basis of the bourgeois regime. The old minimal program is superseded by the transitional program, the task of which lies in the systematic mobilization of the masses for the proletarian revolution." End quote.
a separation of immediate demands from the struggle for socialism. With the restabilization of world capitalism in the immediate post-war period and the subsequent 25-year boom, the defense of the past gains of the working class and the advancement of new ones was, to a great extent, separated from the struggle for political power. Capitalist expansion saw a revival of the discredited thesis of social reformism and opportunism and their insistence that the actual struggles of the working class could never transcend the framework of capitalism. The expansion of capitalism in the post-war boom meant that there was, so to speak, an objective gap between the immediate demands of the working class and the political struggle for its long-term interests. The International Committee and its sections fought throughout this period to bridge this gap through the struggle to mobilize the working class around the demand that its leadership break its ties with the bourgeoisie and undertake the fight for a socialist program. Under conditions in which material gains could be made through trade union struggles, masses of workers gave their allegiance to the social democratic and trade union leaders. The International Committee fought to break the misplaced confidence in these leaderships by bringing the working class into a political struggle against them. Large sections of the petty bourgeois radicals denounced this tactical initiative none more vociferously than the Spartacus. Their opposition then, as now, was to the mobilization of the working class on an independent program against the labor bureaucracy. While the working class was able to make certain material gains on the basis of militant trade union struggles, the post-war experience by no means refutes the Marxist thesis on the relationship between reform and revolution. It has vindicated both positively and negatively. The immediate advances in the social position of the working class in the aftermath of the war were a direct expression of the fear of the bourgeoisie that if concessions were not made, they would face revolutionary struggles. To be sure, the bourgeoisie was able to rely directly upon the social democratic and Stalinist leaderships who were committed to the post-war restoration of capitalist order, but had the conditions of the 1930s returned, there would have been a significant and rapid shift of the masses to the left. The other period of major social advance from the end of the 1960s to the first years of the 1970s was likewise the outcome of the potentially revolutionary struggles stretching from the May-June 1968 events in France to the bringing down of the Heath Tory government by the British miners in 1974. And the Marxist thesis has received a no less powerful negative confirmation. It was precisely the separation of the struggles for its immediate interests from a socialist political perspective that left the working class unprepared for the global offensive undertaken by the bourgeoisie over the past two decades. The essential argument that the Spartacus advance against the International Committee is one of the standard refrains of social democrats, Stalinists, and opportunists of every stripe. That is, to tell the working class it can defend its interests only on the basis of a revolutionary program is to sow defeatism. The unspoken assumption behind this argument is the demoralized view that the working class can never achieve the degree of political consciousness and organization necessary to overthrow capitalism. Thus, the perspective of socialist revolution is unviable. Spartacus' position can be reduced to the following line of argument. The trade unions are the only legitimate form of working class organization. Their traditional program of applying pressure to the bourgeoisie is the only viable program. If these organizations and this program are no longer capable of defending the working class, then all is lost. Either one accepts the present reformist level of political consciousness in the working class and the organizations that uphold that consciousness, or one abandons any form of struggle. Spartacus denies the fall in living standards. In their defense of the viability of trade unionism, the Spartacus go to the most absurd lengths, denying the social reality of declining living standards. The 1993 Perspectives Resolution of the Workers' League, the globalization of capitalist production and the international tasks of the working class, explained that, with the shifting of production to countries with wages a fraction of those in the advanced capitalist nations, there was an inexorable downward leveling of wages and living standards and a relentless assault on past social reforms and legal limitations on the exploitation of labor by capital in the imperialist centers. 
According to the Spartacus, however, merely by pointing to this undeniable process, the Northites are here advancing, with a thin veneer of Marxist rhetoric, an argument propounded by a wide range of bourgeois and petty bourgeois liberals. In other words, because this tendency has been noted by a number of bourgeois economists and journalists motivated by concerns for the stability of capitalist rule, its existence must be denied. On the basis of this ridiculous argument, one might as well just conclude that the whole of Lenin's work Imperialism should be discarded because he drew heavily on the work of the social liberal Hobson, not to speak of other bourgeois economists and journalists of his day. The passage to which the Spartacus object is not of itself a political perspective, but simply a statement of economic fact based on the operations of the capitalist market. If capital is able to purchase commodities in one market more cheaply than in others, and the labor power of the working class, skilled and unskilled, is most assuredly a commodity, then the price of that commodity in all other markets will tend to fall. In essence, the Spartacus denunciation of the International Committee amounts to a denial of the most basic historical tendencies of the capitalist mode of production. As Marx revealed, what distinguished capitalism from all previous modes of social production was its tendency to become all-embracing, to extend to every corner of the globe, and to create a world market. This inherent tendency is bound up with the incessant striving by capital to increase the extraction of surplus value from the working class. The Spartacus thesis now emerges clearly. While there is a general tendency for capital to create a world market, this applies to every commodity save one, labor power. Capital strives to break down every barrier and remove every limitation on its activity, the accumulation of surplus value, but it stops at one. The market for labor power remains constricted within the nation state. This process of globalized production has been characterized by two interconnected tendencies in the labor market. The increasing ability of capital to purchase labor power in any part of the globe and the vast increase in the global supply of labor power. It is estimated that the world supply of labor will increase by around 1 billion over the next decade. The massive destruction of the peasantry through the operations of global capital has created an unprecedented situation. For the first time in human history, the proletariat, the class with nothing to sell but its labor power, constitutes the majority of the world's population. While opposing the advocates of the Iron Law of Wages, Marx pointed to inexorable tendencies within the process of capitalist production, which worked to drive down the price of labor power, i.e. wages. Above all, the continuous advancement of the productive forces and the development of new technologies worsened the position of the working class by reducing the demand for labor and increasing its supply. This has been precisely the impact of computerization and the automation of production processes over the past two decades. The technological transformation of entire production processes has made it possible the elimination of vast amounts of labor, while at the same time enabling production processes to be integrated across vast distances, thereby allowing capital to shift high labor operations to low-wage regions. According to the Spartacus, however, these processes, which have transformed production and the lives of millions of people, are nothing more than the illusory products of a propaganda campaign. Globalization, they write, is but a new variation on an old theme. In the 1950s and early 60s, the term automation was in vested with the same apocalyptic, earth-shaking consequences. Liberal intellectuals predicted that the industrial working class would in large part be replaced by robots and other machinery. One conclusion was that trade unions were becoming or would become obsolete. It would be difficult to find a clearer expression of the indifference of the middle-class radicals to the fate of millions of working people. Over the past two decades, the lives of hundreds of millions of workers, blue-collar and white-collar alike, have been transformed by the introduction of computerized, automated methods of production and information processing, leading to a vast destruction of jobs.
One does not have to subscribe to the predictions of bourgeois commentators that robots will replace the working class to recognize the far-reaching changes automation has introduced into the workplace and the abject failure of the unions to defend workers against its short-term impact or provide the working class with a means for harnessing these changes to its longer-term benefit. It is an undeniable fact that young, skilled, and semi-skilled workers today have far less chance of attaining a secure, decent-paying job in auto, the mines, and many other industries than did their fathers or grandfathers, and that this is due, in large measure, to the introduction of robotics and other automated techniques. Spartacus dismisses automation just as it discounts globalization in order to boost illusions in the trade unions which are incapable of confronting either phenomenon in a way that accords with the interests of the working class. Economic Nationalism and American Chauvinism According to the Spartacus, wages in the advanced capitalist countries are not going to be driven down anything close to third world levels for two reasons, one political, the other economic. The political reason centers upon the claim that the various imperialist powers will not permit the shift of capital to take place to such an extent that military capacities are endangered, and that at a certain point they'll impose tariff and other restrictions on the movement of capital. In the next few years, the US, Germany, and Japan may well impose against the immediate interests and desires of sections of their own capitalist classes, high levels of trade protectionism, controls of foreign exchange transactions, and strict limits on the inflow and outflow of capital, they insist. Let us for a moment take the Spartacus assertions at face value. There is an ultimate floor on wage levels in the advanced capitalist countries, they argue, because at a certain point the imperialist powers will invoke measures to restrict the movement of capital all around the world. Consequently, it will be possible for the trade unions to exert pressure, provided their leadership is sufficiently willing to play hardball on the national bourgeoisie, and carry out their designated task of the defense of the workers' interests within capitalism. Once again, all will be for the best, and the necessity for social revolution will have been averted. Now, let us come back to reality and consider for a moment the consequences of the actions the Spartacus maintain will protect real wages, such as the integration of the world economy, that tariff and other protective measures would not only disrupt world trade with a repeat of the disastrous consequences of the 1930s, they would also bring about a severe dislocation of the production processes of major corporations, which no longer operate national-based factories and processes, but integrate different aspects of production on a world scale. The integration of such tariffs, combined with restrictions on the flow of capital, would bring about a financial and industrial collapse of staggering proportions. This is not a matter of conjecture. Its outlines have already been made clearly visible. In 1995, for example, the trade war between the U.S. and Japan, in which the Clinton administration threatened restrictive tariffs on imports of cars, resulted in a truce when the Japanese authorities threatened that such measures would provoke a withdrawal of the financial inflows holding up the American stock and bond markets. Not only would the measures envisaged by the Spartacus bring about a financial collapse, they would create the conditions for a new inter-imperialist war, as each imperialist power sought to expand its position at the expense of its rivals. In other words, the very political measures that the Spartacus insist will ensure the maintenance of relatively high wages in the advanced capitalist countries would, if enacted, bring about a breakdown of the world capitalist economy, leading inexorably to another war. While the Spartacus arguments might appear at first sight to be a kind of madness, they reveal a social logic and method. As Lenin and other Marxists explained in the first part of last century, the material basis for the formation of a privileged labor aristocracy and trade union bureaucracy in the advanced capitalist countries lay in the super profits extracted by the imperialist powers from the colonies and backward capitalist nations. This is the social layer for whom the Spartacus speak, a layer that will demand tariff protection, financial regulation by the national state, and ultimately military action when the claim that this is necessary to protect wages, living standards, and our way of life. The same social outlook is revealed in the economic arguments advanced by the Spartacus in support of their wages floor thesis. 
Major firms, they insist, will continue to use more expensive labor in the advanced capitalist countries because 15 unskilled workers in Indonesia earning well under a dollar an hour cannot replace a skilled machinist in the U.S. earning 15 an hour or Germany earning 25 an hour in the process of industrial production. Once again, the unrestrained chauvinism so characteristic of the bureaucratic layers for whom the Spartacus speak comes bursting forth. It never occurs to them that there are skilled workers in Indonesia, India, China, and elsewhere. Skilled workers only inhabit the advanced capitalist countries. The issue is not the replacement of a $15 per hour machinist in the U.S. with 15 workers in Indonesia paid $1 per hour or less, but the replacement of a machinist in the U.S. with one in China or Indonesia, or in the case of Germany, with a machinist in Czechoslovakia or Poland, Spain or Russia, paid at a much lower rate. In the past, when technical considerations required that entire production processes had to be carried out in one center, the location of these industries was, to a great extent, determined by the location of skilled labor and backup facilities for capital equipment. But skilled labor can be developed in any part of the globe. There is now an international market not only for unskilled labor, but skilled workers as well. A computer programmer in the U.S. is thrown into competition with a computer programmer in Bangalore, an American machinist with a machinist in China or India. Apart from revealing their utterly chauvinistic outlook, the economic arguments of the Spartacus make clear their indifference to the vast mass of workers in the advanced capitalist countries who are earning nothing like $15 and $25 per hour. In fact, wages have fallen so low that manufacturers in the advanced capitalist countries have found that they no longer have to venture overseas to find third world conditions. They exist at home. You know, already. Globalized Production and Proletarian Internationalism The eagerness with which the Spartacus advance both their political and economic arguments for a wages floor expresses their ingrained hostility to a revolutionary perspective. In sum, the arguments of the Spartacists... Or, I don't even know... Is that really... How do you say it? I don't know how to say it. I'm just going to keep saying it how I've said it amount to nothing less than a call for the maintenance of the social and economic conditions that have formed such a crucial prop for the bourgeoisie. In the past, under the previous regime of national as opposed to globalized production, the wages and living standards of workers were determined not merely by the type of labor they performed, but also by the country in which they lived. That is, living standards and social conditions were determined not only by class, but nationality, and it was this material factor which played such a crucial role in enabling the bourgeoisie, in collaboration with the reformist and Stalinist parties, to block the development of a genuine socialist and international nationalist outlook in the working class. There was some basis from the standpoint of the short-term, immediate interests of the workers for the claim that what was good for General Motors was good for the American worker, or the Holden worker in Australia, or the Opel worker in Germany, and consequently a material foundation for an appeal to nationalism. The situation has changed irrevocably. The conditions of the working class in one country are now more and more directly connected to the social position of the working class throughout the world. The globalization of production has created unprecedented material conditions for the development of genuine internationalism, not as some kind of external solidarity between nationally based working classes, but as the mode of struggle of one global working class. This is the objective basis for the perspective of the International Committee, the construction of the World Party of World Socialist Revolution as the organizing center of the world proletariat. If the Spartacus and other petty bourgeois radicals are so desperate to maintain the fiction that globalization has changed nothing, it is because they instinctively recognize that it has shattered the foundations of their own nationalist and opportunist politics. The Spartacus League's chauvinist arguments on wages are crowned by an attempt to provide a theoretical rationale for the whole exercise by referring to Trotsky's theory of permanent revolution. The Northite notion of globalization, they write, 
is in its theoretical essence a repudiation of the Trotskyist understanding of permanent revolution, because it posits a tendency to equalize economic conditions throughout the world by leveling up productivity in backwards countries and leveling down productivity in the advanced ones. In the first place, there is a complete jumbling of the processes involved in the global movement of productive capital. According to the Spartacus, to point to the tendency for the equalization of wages is to make an assertion that productivity is falling in the advanced capitalist countries and rising in the backwards countries. The reality is that wage rates are not directly and mechanically related to productivity as anyone who has the slightest familiarity with Marxist political economy can demonstrate. The wage rates paid to workers in any section of industry, whether skilled or unskilled, are not determined by their output, but by the value of their labor power. If skilled workers are more highly paid than unskilled workers, it is not because they are more productive, but because it takes longer to produce them. Considerable time is spent in training and education, and the value of the labor power around which their wage levels fluctuate in the market is higher. The tendency for the equalization of wages does not arise because of movements in productivity in both the advanced capitalist countries and the backward countries alike. The productivity of labor is rising, but from the increased supply of labor, Productive capital now has at its disposal vast quantities of labor which previously for all practical purposes were beyond its reach. The claim that globalization implies a tendency to equalize economic conditions and thereby contradicts the theory of permanent revolution is answered quite clearly by Trotsky himself, quote, in contrast to the economic systems which preceded it, capitalism inherently and constantly aims at economic expansion, at the penetration of new territories, the surmounting of economic differences, the conversion of self-sufficient and provincial national governments into a system of financial interrelationships. Thereby, it brings about their rapprochement and equalizes the economic and cultural levels of the most progressive and the most backward countries. Without this main process, it would be impossible to conceive of the relative leveling out, first of Europe with Great Britain, and then of America with Europe, the industrialization of the colonies, the diminishing gap between India and Great Britain, and all the consequences arising from the enumerated processes upon which is based not only the program of the Communist International, but also its very existence. These lines were written against the Stalinists, who invoked uneven development to bolster their nationalist perspective of socialism in one country. They apply no less forcefully to the Spartacus, who invoke uneven development in order to justify their assertion that the working class can still advance its interest within the framework of capitalism, provided its leadership is sufficiently militant. In other words, uneven development is now invoked as the basis for a theory of social reformism in one country or a group of countries, or more accurately, for a particular and increasingly narrow and privileged section of the working class in one country or group of countries.